Hi and welcome back to the Forum Astoria. Um, I'm again Matt and this is Philip. Um, and this is our second podcast. Very exciting, Matthew. As always. And we've decided that for today what we're going to do is we're going to um, sort of continue our discussion from last time and we're going to look at specifically um, the Church of Hagia Sophia, which is of course in um, the great city of Constantinople. Um, and the way it's going to kind of work out is Philip here is going to talk a bit about the sort of origins of the Hagia Sophia um, and its architecture and design and things like that. Whereas I'm going to look at sort of um, the internals of it and in particular the sort of mosaics that um, quite richly decorate the, the, the walls of the chambers inside it. Yeah, um, so the, the Church of the Hagia Sophia itself is actually the third church. There were, there were two others hmm. before that. The, the first church, um, if you remember from our first episode, when the city was constructed and dedicated by Constantine and his son Constantius II, they originally built in the um, palace grounds this Church to the Holy Wisdom, and ancient sources, particularly the Chronicon Pascale, say that this church was dedicated in about the year 360. So for context, this is right at the end of Constantius II's reign, just before he'll die quite suddenly, just before Julian the Apostate enters the city. And um, this church, about half a century, a century later, is in typical Constantinople fashion. Can you guess how it was burnt down, Matthew? Uh, some kind of riot. Wow. <laughs> it, typical, it was, it was burnt down in a riot between the supporters of John Chrysostom, who was a Nicene Christian, and uh, supporters of the Emperor, a Emperor Empress <laughs> Ailey Eudoxia, who was an Arian. Um, and she had wanted him sacked from his position as Patriarch of Constantinople, which, for context, is the highest religious post in the city. And his supporters, in true fashion, rioted, and they burnt down the church accidentally. Quite ironic. Accidentally. Yeah. Quite ironically, of course, burn yeah. down your place of work. Classic. <laughs> I, I wish I could do that. Um, so a few years later then we get the second church which is built by the son of Ailey Eudoxia, Theodosius II, and it's a quite unremarkable church. It exists, it's the site of uh, many a mass, many divine liturgy, coronations, etc. until we get to the time of Justinian where the, during the Nika riots this church is eventually, again, burnt down. So third time is the charm, as mm -hmm. they always say. Um, and so because of the Nika riots, Justinian wants to build a new church. And both prior churches were built in this basilica fashion, which is characterized by just a long, long hallway. If you've ever been to Rome, uh, Santa Sabina is probably the best example of this, or if you're in Trier, uh, Constantine's Basilica, because basilicas are old law buildings, and if you remember, Matthew, they're, what are they? Yeah, um, so yeah, because like a basilica back in um, <clears throat> the old Roman days, the old um, Roman Republic, for example, um, a basilica was part of the, the Roman Forum, um, and it was essentially just, you know, your law courts and, and things like that were um, public meeting public areas, meeting areas and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. And so this eventually becomes kind of uh, taken over by Christians who see it as a, a place for them to meet. And so by the time of Constantine onwards, basilicas have now become a more religious connotation and the the current Hagia Sophia that you'll see today now in Istanbul is actually a dome not a basilica so this is in a way a very revolutionary design because 
prior to that, as I just said, all churches were mainly in this basilica form. Domes don't really come about in Eastern architecture in the same way that you get in Rome and in the West, where domes are quite frequent. If you, say, look at the Pantheon or any sort of, like, the Mausoleum of Augustus, that they all use this circular architecture, mm. archways, domes. But no, Constantinople doesn't have this until um, we see Julia, Anna, and Sina, who on her private property builds a small church to St. Polyuptos. And historians kind of assume that this is the inspiration for Justinian, um, who right it, it's right around this time that the Nika riots happen and for context the Nika riots are these massive riots I think was it five days they went for Matthew uh, something like that something, something yeah like that, yeah that um there was the reds and the greens hmm. who are charioteer teams which are play a prominent role in Constantinople politics hmm. procr proclaimed the nephew of Anastasius I, who was Justinian's uncle's predecessor, and they say, we want him to be emperor. So they start chanting Nika, 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 which means victory in Greek. And so these massive riots actually almost threaten to upseat Justinian. And according to Procopius and his quite slanderous secret history he says that it's only because of Theodora the man that he thinks she is mm. who stops Justinian from fleeing onto a boat into exile when she says purple makes for a great funeral sh shroud <laughs> um, and so because of these riots a huge part of the city from the Hippodrome to the palace in this central area is burnt to the ground and so this in a way actually provides Justinian with a great opportunity to rebuild the city in his own image and this comes a lot up in Procopius in his buildings work and he talks about how Justinian uh, designs uh, about four or five, if not more, major construction works. So firstly, there's the Hagia Sophia, but he also commissions yeah. the construction of a slightly smaller domed church, Hagia Irene. Uh, then he remodels the Senate House, he creates the bars of Zeuxippus, and creates a forum called the Augusteum. And and so this all happens in 532. And quite amazingly, it's only five years later in 537 that we see on December 27th, just after Christmas, that they are then commissioning and consecrating the church for use. And the first ever mass is written down by Procopius, who is honestly blown away. And uh, you mm. can see why, Matthew, when you yeah. look at the building's sure. interior. And if you want, to, you want to talk about some of the interior and just to explain why Procopius would be blown away by such an impressive interior. So yeah, so the, the interior of High Sophia, it's, it's laden with um, these, these gorgeous, rich, golden um, mosaics uh, throughout, you know, the various different chambers and such um, of the church, and and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk th you through kind of um, sort of five examples, five common examples um, um, of these, uh, and sort of lay out a few arguments for you. So so you know the f the first one is that um, what a lot of these mosaics are really good at doing is showing us the sort of um, role of the emperor as being the the head of of Christianity um, as, as that sort of protector um, of the people uh, through God right and and um, giving gifts to God in return for protection um, and things like that 
Um, and the other sort of argument I'm going to make is that um, the other sort of uh, mosaics really show us that they're quite a good reflection of the divine liturgy that's performed and sung um, in the form of hymns and obviously um, you know, readings from um, from the priests and deacons and whatnot um, by by visually showing these sorts of things that they're actually talking about from you know the book of the gospel and, and etc and other divine texts um, and so the first one I thought um, that would be quite a good one to really uh, look at originally is the the southwest entrance mosaic um, which is in the the, the um, the South Vestibule. Um, and the reason this is this one I want to start with is because it's probably the most um, well-known image um, from within Hagia Sophia, um, but also it's it's the first one you'll see once you enter because it's, it's at the entrance. Um, and you can see from this photo that it, it, it stands above the hallway entrance um, and it looks down upon the observer. And, and this would have been the doorway that the Emperor would have met the Patriarch and they both would have walked in together at the front of the imper Imperial procession into yep. the main church area. Exactly, and so whenever they entered, this is what they would be first greeted with before anything else. So just looking at it now, um, what we can kind of see here is in the centre of the image we have obviously um, the Virgin Mary. Um, and um, Christ in the form of, of the child. Um, to the Virgin's right, we have Justinian, um, and to our left, we have um, Constantine the Great. Before we go any further, like it, this is quite a large mosaic, actually. It's it's about five meters wide, um, and it's about three meters tall. So, you know, just to give you an example of the size of these, like they're, they're quite large. Um, in general, um, the smallest one we're going to look at is about four meters or so. So um, they're, they're, they're fairly big um, images. But uh, what this image is kind of telling us here is that um, Constantine and Justinian they're both offering to um, to Christ. And in this case, Constantine's offering the great city of Constantinople itself, um, whereas Justinian is offering um, Hagia Sophia, the Church of Hagia Sophia, to Christ. Um, and you can see that, that Christ is actually um, accepting these gifts as he's doing the um, the blessing. blessing yeah. I was going to say benediction. Sign of the cross. Sign of the cross, yeah. Um, and so this is kind of where we can see two sort of examples of what the role of the emperor was. So firstly, um, a small side note, you know, one of their roles was obviously to, to be a builder, um, as, as both of these great examples are quite profound builders. Um, but in a religious sort of aspect, we can see that their role is that of the head of the church in the sense that they're um, offering gifts to Christ in return for protection and blessing. There's sort of a dual nature to the monarchy. Yeah, yeah, precisely, right? And so, so the giving these gifts to Christ um, in return themselves and the people of Rome will be um, blessed and protected from their enemies. And right? this sort of mindset, this um, Pax Deorum, is Precisely. just an incredibly Roman thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I mean that Pax Deorum, you know, that continues from from the very early days where they were they were pagans into even you know to this much period, into obviously. the Christian period. Yeah, which we can clearly see from this um, from this image that's um, being shown here. Um, the inscriptions themselves, so there's, there's uh, obviously two monograms um, to the left and right of, of um, the Virgin Mary, and those are just saying, as I said, um, Emperor Justinian and Constantine. Um, but the larger inscriptions to the left, uh, to, to Justinian's right and Constantine's left, these inscriptions, obviously we need to keep in mind that these are going to be read by the literary elite because obviously not everybody in this period um, can read, in fact most people can't. Um, but essentially Constantine <clears throat> says, uh, Constantine the great emperor amongst the saints, whereas Justinian's he gets kind of a, a more bland sort of inscription, whereas um, his is Justinian, emperor of illustrious memory. Um, and I find it quite interesting um, that Justinian doesn't get sort of a greater inscription here because he 
it did create his it's, it's his church and this is inside of his church but from these inscriptions what we can um can infer is that this particular mosaic was obviously not created um in the time of justinian right it was created quite a long time after but uh sources aren't entirely sure it's somewhere between the 10th and the 12th century which is quite a long time frame but um but but somewhere around there we, we but we can tell that it's not from justinian based on what the inscriptions say otherwise he wouldn't have his illustrious memory yet um, and interestingly enough as well the if you looked at say the ravenna mosaics the portrayal of justinian is completely different to what justinian looks like mm. in the ravenna mosaics and they are from his time so that again shows yeah. that these are quite far removed yeah very much very so. artistically different very much so um one sort of last thing to note um about this is the the offering of constantinople we can see that it's quite well lit um on one side it's it's quite bright and in full splendor um, and the other side is in sort of shade and darkness and um, those two quite, you know, they juxtapose quite well. And of course, it's, it's to bring out the sort of beauty that is Constantinople. It's, it, it is, to the Romans, the most splendid city on earth. It is, it is literally heaven on earth um, from their perspective. Otherwise, Christ would not be accepting it um, as an offer. Um, whereas if we look at the image of Hagia Sophia, it's actually quite dull and it's not lit quite as well. Um, and that's really because the building itself of Hagia Sophia is not necessarily what's important about it. It's what happens inside. It's the, the chants and the, the liturgy performed and the mosaics themselves that are inside that are gorgeous and gold encrusted that really are what's important about it and that's that's how it's kind of being represented here is the outside of it being sort of dull and less of importance and one of the interesting things is over time because this is a very old church you get sort of these uh folklore sort of myths rising about and with the doors that these uh, mosaics are above supposedly it comes about that people now believe that they are the same wood that came from noah's ark and i don't know how that's possible but <laughs> that is what they believed as the story goes as course. the story goes see from from that image we're going to kind of move on to um our next one which so so this one is from um the imperial gallery uh, sorry the imperial portraits in this it's an imperial portrait in the south gallery um and um and so in this particular mosaic is it's it's quite a good example of um a lot of these imperial portraits they all kind of show a very similar image and we'll, we'll see that in a second when i um show you uh, the next one after this but this image is um it, it's called the um, the Zoe panel because on the right here we have um, Empress Zoe, um, and on the left we have the Emperor um, at the time uh, Constantine the Ninth uh, Monomachos, um, which is around um, 1042 to 1055. Um, so we know that this um, particular image is from around then, um, but dating it to an exact year is, is again a bit difficult. Um, the image of Jesus in this case is, um, it's, it's quite an important one and it, it occurs quite a lot in Byzantine art. Um, it's the, it's, it's Christ as the, the Pantocrator, which essentially is the all-powerful Christ, right? Um, so if you have, you know, the Emperor being called the Autocrator, the Pantocrator is sort of the leader or the Emperor of the Emperor. Um, in that case, he's the Lord of, of the Emperor. King of Kings. King of Kings, exactly. Um, so yeah, in this uh, portrait, what we can see is um, Constantine the Ninth. He he hasn't got anything um, to give to Christ in the same regard as what um, Constantine the Great and Justinian did. Um, and so what he's offering is actually a bag of um, solid gold um, Salidi to Christ um, and of course Christ is accepting it because again he's doing um, the blessing 
um, and on the right we can we can see the, the sort of role of um, the empress as well um, in this sort of religious understanding because um, her inscription is Zoe the most pious Augusta right so we can see that she is quite active in this um, role um, of, of the emperors and the the empresses as the sort of leader of the church um, so again we can see you know you don't have to necessarily um, build things and offer it or um, uh, they don't have to dedicate it um, you know buildings that they built to Christ necessarily um, but they can also make offerings to the church um, and to Christ um, in the form of gold um, in this case um, I'll read you uh, Constantine the Ninth's inscription as well because it'll be quite um, important in a second but his inscription is Const uh, Constantine in Christ the God Autocrat um, faithful king of the Romans um, Monomarchos right and we'll see why that's kind of important because it's the sort of generic um, uh, system or um, the sort of standard that that all of these sort of imperial portraits kind of follow um, template yeah template sorry <clears throat> is, uh, is quite a good way of um, putting it um, because when we move on to the next one um, which is uh, what's referred to as the John panel um, again this is in the, the South Gallery um, in the imperial portrait section um, what we can actually see is that the image is practically identical um, the only difference here is instead of um, Christ as the Panto Crasor, we instead have um, the Virgin Mary and Christ as the child, which again is another quite um, common uh, reoccurring artistic image of, of Christ and the Virgin. Um, but that's practically the only difference, right? Other than obviously the features of the Emperor and the um, Empress herself. Um, but the actual inscriptions here are pretty much the same. Um, for example, uh, we have John the Second on the left, Commonus, um, and his is John in Christ, uh, the God, faithful King, born in the purple and autocrat of the Romans, the Commonus. We can see it's it's practically an identical um, inscription with with some minor um, details changed, um, and his. Empress here, who is Irene, uh, the daughter of Saint Ladislaus of Hungary, um, she has the exact same uh, inscription as um, as Zoe in the previous one. Hers is Irene, the most pious Augusta. Um, so, you know, the the point is that this image is is pretty much used um, for most of the portraits, right? It's a, it's it's really what the emperor's role was here in a religious sense, right? Making offerings to Christ, to the church, um, in return for blessings, um, and in return for um, salvation, um, and etc. The uh, the next sort of mosaic we're going to look at is um, so yeah. So this image uh, it's referred to as the central lunettes um, image, um, and it's it's in the narthex. Um, this one's dated likely to uh, the ninth century. Um, although there's no actual inscriptions on this one to really identify any of these people, but um, Thomas Whitmore, the guy who actually um, uncovered all of the one, all of the mosaics we've been talking about in the 30s, um, he believes that this is actually Emperor um, Leo VI, who reigned from um, 886 to 912, so um, around that time. Um, and it, it's it's quite a compelling argument that he makes. So I would suggest that this is, of course, Leo VI. Um, but the reason I show you this one is because it's quite a different one from what we've been seeing before. Um, again, of course, we can see um, Christ as the Pantocrator, um, but it's not the same. Um, Leo VI, the, the sort of image in the bottom left here, um, bowing at the feet of Christ, is not making an offering of any sort of... Um, well, at least we can't see him making an offering. He just seems to be praying and sort of worshipping. Um, and also note that Christ here, he's not wearing the um, the usual um, ultramarine blue um, robes that he, he wears in, in most of the other images. Um, and, and similarly, Leo VI is not wearing his, um, his imperial regalia. Instead, he's wearing white. Um, the, both of them are wearing white. 
um, and in particular uh, white shoes and usually um, Byzantine emperors will wear this sort of um, regalia for ceremonial events um, and I would suggest that this ceremonial event in particular is Easter um, because Christ is, is holding a book open um, with an inscription that says peace be with you I am the light of the world um, and, and sort of the reason I uh, interpret this as being um, Easter is because that sort of bit at the end I'm the light of the world it sounds kind of like an introduction that perhaps Jesus might have given after his resurrection you know he's telling people like I'm back kind of thing and um, and I've I've become more than just um, a person you know I'm now I've, I've I'm back baby <laughs> yeah you know I've, I've been resurrected and, and I'm you know now um, God and this sort of prostate prostrate penance um, is a very common Easter sort of celebration. Mm. You see the Pope do it, um, you see lots of medieval kings will get down and prostrate themselves mm. before the church or they'll crawl across a large area yep. wearing rags and delivering arms. Yeah, very much so. Um, and so this this image again, it really invokes um, that sort of reflection of um, the the divine liturgy and the hymns that were sung. Um, you know, for example, a lot of these um, um, hymns that are sung are all about um, calling out to be heard by God, to be saved, um, and we can see that obviously from the work of Capella Romana, who's restored quite a lot of these um, divine um, hymns. And I'd really recommend looking them up because mm. they're very interesting. Some of their uh, reconstructed hymns, the way they used popping a balloon in the museum mm. to get the acoustics on how it would have sounded because music isn't allowed to be played within the current church, yeah. museum, mosque very at all. So. Um, and, and like, again, that's, you know, that's a topic of its own right. Um, we only have so much time in the day, Matthew. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Um, um, the two figures to the left and right of, of Christ, they're quite um, different images. We don't usually see um, Byzantine mosaics with figures in these um, roundels in the same way that this is occurring, as we've seen from the previous um, examples that we've seen. Um, again, we don't really know who they are, but uh, Leo the Sixth. Um, was sort of a patron of the Virgin um, Mary and um, the Archangel Gabriel and so it's believed that these figures are um, his protectors um, in this particular um, image as well. Um, but the, the reason I'm showing you this one is because it shows us that other side of you know the other purpose of these mosaics and that is to reflect and echo the liturgy that's actually being um, performed in, you know, both hymn and um, and readings inside Hagia Sophia, right? We can see this um, as a, as an image of, of Easter, which obviously comes from the divine liturgy um, that would be performed inside, um, and and this is just an example of that, um, which kind of brings us to our last image, um, and also. Uh, one of our latest images um, from around uh, the, the 12, the, the sort of late 1200s, 1260s, 1270s ish. Um, and we, we kind of um, know that this is quite a later image compared to the rest because um, if you look at the expressions on the faces of the characters in this one, um, they all seem to have real emotions or more realistic emotions, more realistic facial expressions compared to the previous ones, which are a bit more um, what we might consider cartoony. Um, and so we can see that sort of um, change in artistic style again and that 
sort of improvements of, of um, artistry throughout the Byzantine period and, and certainly in the late Byzantine period. Um, the figures in this, again, we have Christ in the center. <clears throat> again, the classic Pantocrat or um, image. Again, he's carrying the Book of the Gospel. Um, flanked on his right is, of course, the Virgin Mother. Um, and on his left is um, John the Baptist, or he's denoted in this particular image as John the Forerunner. Um, I would suggest that uh, this kind of image is representing um, sort of Judgment Day. Um, and again, in that way, we can kind of um, see that sort of reflection of the divine liturgy that's being performed mm. inside of High Sophia. Um, and something that I'd just quickly like to really note, this is sort of a little bit off topic, is sort of the facial expressions of um, John the Baptist here. Um, yeah, so if you note the, the sort of facial expressions of John <clears throat> the Baptist here, he looks quite remorseful and quite um, sad uh, in this particular image, which I find quite interesting because Judgment Day in um, divine liturgy in, in Christianity is seen both as sort of... Um, you know, a good thing and a bad thing, right? So, you know, it's it's good, obviously, because, um, you know, if you've done good in the world and you've um, um, been absolved of all your sins, you you know, you go to heaven and you can live out, um, your, your soul lives out eternity in heaven, which is obviously a great thing. Um, but the other thing is that when you die, um, you go to purgatory. Um, if you haven't been the best person in the world, but you also don't qualify um, for hell, um, and while you're in purgatory, you have to, you know, pray and do penance and things like that for, for your sins. Um, and your family members that are still um, alive can light candles and make donations to the church and also pray for you and things like that to um, get you to go to heaven um, sooner. And the thing about that is that if you don't um, end up in heaven prior to Judgment Day, it's kind of it. You're, you're sort of done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you didn't do penance you didn't absolve yourself of your sins and you were if you're catholic obviously and you were in purgatory at the time of judgment day it's it's kind of like a cutoff like that's it you you're there right and you you're not going to heaven from that point so in that way um you know christians supposedly were always preparing for judgment day um and that's why they were always trying to absolve themselves of their sin because they didn't they always thought the judgment day was going to happen any day now kind of thing and so Going back to John the Baptist here, um, who is a, a character from the first century who went around obviously um, baptizing people and um, converting people to Christianity um, in a way saving their souls, it's kind of almost like he's remorseful that he couldn't save more um, in that way. And that, that's kind of how I interpret the sort of um, his, his sort of sorrow here that um, the artist is, is kind of trying to convey. Um, in this image, but uh, but yeah, um, one thing to note about this uh, image in particular, other than that, is as we can see, it's um, not in the best of shape. When um, Thomas Whitmore um, discovered this one, um, it it was it pretty much fell apart, um, as we can see the result of. Yeah, conservation has really been a, a major concern with the church. I mean, as, as we know, Constantinople is on the water. The, mm. the Golden Horn juts out into the ocean. So water cracking, humidity, mm. rain, hail, sleet, this is, these are all problems. And especially with mosaics, mm. that because there is tiny bits of mortar in between each little um, square, or, square yeah. yes, of gold plate or stone with water over the centuries, that eventually expands and you find bits dropping off here mm. and there. And in the, with this particular, the Desus mosaic in particular, um, there's been the problem because during the Ottoman period, most, if not all, of the mosaics were plastered over mm. and covered up for about 500 years. Yeah. And although these preserved them from the elements, to physically take off the plaster, you find almost like when you wax, it's mm. ripping off little bits here and there. 
and now that they're finely exposed and you have humidity from thousands and thousands of people coming in on a daily basis and their breath like any museum this is causing humidity and you find that the mortar is cracking and even back in the 19th century we had this wonderful Swiss architect Gaspare Fassati mm. who was the um, architect in charge of restoration and even he struggled and all throughout then we found that conservation is just almost impossible mm. and especially now with the reconversion to a mosque and the um, so-called rechanneling of funds into different filters on what the priorities for the Hagia Sophia are mm. we find that con conservation is not the priority anymore quite tragically I'd mm. say Matthew Which is, you are definitely so with the mosaics as well because they are so high I mean the dome is mm. hundred hundreds of meters but it's fairly tall yeah it's, it's 80 meters it's, I yeah. thought high the problem with actually physically getting up there um, if you see recent pictures there's a whole bunch of scaffolding in the mm. center and so you have to get up there and gravity is working against you pulling these mosaics down mm. um, and one of the most devastating uh, problems that has is because the city is on a tectonic plate line that separates Europe from Asia there are earthquakes very often and as you can imagine earthquakes are very devastating mm. even just after Justinian had built the church um, there was an earthquake that caused a crack in the dome and then also in the 10th and the 14th century there were the partial collapse of the dome because of these earthquakes but thankfully modern architectural sciences has kind of stopped these from being as devastating as what they mm. used to be but they are still a concern yeah yeah so i hope that this has been eye-opening i certainly have actually learned a lot about the Hagia sophia that very i didn't realize so. matthew very much so uh the sort of final thing i want to say is that um Hagia sophia the way it was used the way it's presented with the mosaics and things like that it really feels like from a christian perspective um the attempts uh by by humans to to contact um god and and sort of everything about it the resonance that um occurs inside of it when when um singing um divine liturgy and things like that and the echoes from um the walls inside the chambers it's it's really as if it's to amplify um the prayers of the people um to be saved by god and and you know that's reflected obviously in um the hymns that are actually sung a lot of them are actually about um calling out to god to be heard to be saved um by god um in judgment day in this this last mosaic kind of thing that we were looking at um and it, it feels like the same sort of idea as um, the Renaissance painters, um, you know, Michelangelo's um, famous artwork of the creation of David, where um, he reaches out to touch God but never actually manages to do so, you know, um, and, and they never actually manage to connect in that way. And how Michelangelo manages to capture um, that in a visual representation, whereas Hagia Sophia is a not just a visual but an audio, like an audible and a, a physical um, manifestation of this attempt to to contact, um, in their view, the Creator and things like that. And I think that's why Hagia Sophia itself is is so special um, to to not just the Christians, but even you know to us today researching it and things like that. But so yeah. yeah, I'm so glad we got to hang out and chat again, and yep. I really hope that we get to do this again, so see you all soon!